All right, well, let's go ahead and get started right at the beginning with creation here. And I'm going to have you go to Genesis, and you're just going to kind of keep your finger here because um, we're going to spend most of the time right here. And again, I know a lot of these verses are going to be familiar to you, but I think it's so important, especially some of these very foundational scriptures about who we are, our origin story, where we, how we were created. Those are ones that we shouldn't just memorize, but we should actually really dig into the words of all of them. So we're going to do some of the more of what we did at uh, New Mercies, where we, I introduced you to some verse mapping, where you kind of take some words and like, let's really look at what these words mean. So just to read the passage here, first Genesis 1:27 says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Man, lots and lots packed into every one. So the first thing that you see is God right there. So what I find interesting about when you look at this is that this is the word for God, the name for God, Elohim, which is actually a plural of the word for God. It's, he's the one true God. And the word there is, it's grammatically plural plural, but it's a singular term. So I think this is just, just this really cool way that the Lord in his word tucks in the Trinity, right? It's a plural of this word. We can look at other scriptures where this points back to who was present at creation, but that would just, I know, that's too fun. So, but the Trinity is kind of alluded to there. So, so God, that's who we're talking about here. Elohim, the creator God, the true God. And we see that in the singular meaning for, an elo, for a plural word. Next, you see created, okay? So, and, and look how many times, one verse, and we've got created. Created man, created him, created them. Do you think he's trying to make a point? When, the, when scripture repeats itself, it's not because it ran out of words. It wants you to know Elohim, the one true God, made this, Okay? to shape, to bring, bring something into existence. He is literally, he fashioned it. It was his, it was in his mind to do so, his intellect to do so. He knew how to do all of it. He created it. It was all him, but created, created, created. I love that it's repeating that. It's trying to make sure, yes, that you understand that he is a creative God that actually fashioned us. But the creation also speaks to something when you are the one that creates something you have a hand into how it's going to work. And we're going to talk about a lot of that today because how it works is gets to be designed and defined by the one who actually created it. And so he's just reminding you over here, created man, created him, created them over and over. Okay, the next one, just quickly, I'll show you these man, uh, just to break up these words, because this is talking about a person, a dom. You might recognize that kind of looks like Adam. We might have gotten that from there. So it's person, human, single human of either gender, right? Male or female, that's what it's just talking about, created man. But then God will get a little more specific in a minute. But first look at where he says that he created us in the image of God. So what does that word mean? Because this is one where I've kind of challenged you guys a little bit to not let that one just kind of glaze over you like, oh, cool. Yeah, no, this is such a big word. So it says here just the definition, visual appearance of something or someone. But I wanted to actually read to you a little bit of what the Bible knowledge commentary says about this particular word. Because it says in this sense, it's being used in a figurative because God does not have a human form, but being in God's image means that humans share though imperfectly and finitely, right? Because we are limited in how we can communicate this in God's nature. That is in his communicable attribute, attributes, his love, his wisdom, his holiness, his justice. So to have the capacity, it says, for spiritual fellowship with him. So to say we are in the image of God is not like saying, okay, you just hold up a mirror and like, oh, this must be what God looks like. It's not, that's not really what's being communicated here. But by being created in the image of God, having, you know, almost like you could think of his stamp, his impression upon us, we are able in our finite and imperfect way because we are humans, but we can, we can share in his, some of his attributes. That's why when scripture says every good and perfect gift that comes from above comes from the Father of heavenly lights, right? Every good and perfect gift. We receive good gifts. Where those, are, those are reflections of the good creator. Uh, when, we, when we look at some wisdom, when we look at love, when we look at justice, those are all perfectly communicated by a holy, perfect God. 
but we're able to finitely limited, we're able to understand those things. And by, by doing so, even in our limited capacity, that encourages our fellowship with God. Does that make sense? I mean, it's just a lot more than just a little like, oh, image of God, that's nice. Okay, so moving on, then he says, image of God, he created him male and female, he created them. So both of these words, first male, I'm just pointing out that guess what? They're different. And these definitions kind of cra you know, crack me up. You know, if you look at male, it says, gender of a species that is not female, okay? <laughs> and female, guess what? It's going to be a female, this human species that's not male, okay? It's just, it, these definitions today are almost funny to us that we have to go, Okay, right, that's what that means. But this is really important as we think about all the confusion and all the things that are so convoluted in our society. And it's just like, look how clear scripture is. It's, it's one of the things that I love about this and really like tonight and, and all going forward. You know, I said last week was like all the dark, all the backdrop, because that's like, that's the grossness and where feminism and what the, where the world leads you and how they want to identify you and how maybe even our sin wants to identify us sometimes. But God has a different idea. And all the way, he's gonna get real rudimentary right here and say, hey, guess what? Female, it's not male. Male, it's not female. Got it? So it, 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 I just love the simplicity of it. There is no confusion in it. It's so, so clear. And we, we know in the New Testament that Jesus affirms this too. So we see this here. But then if you flip into your New Testament in Mark 10, that's where Jesus affirms this. And he says, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Okay, that's all we need to know, right? But there is this clear implication today from, um, from Genesis 127. Because here we have this perfect created picture. Okay, it's not lacking anything. There's no mistakes. He's very clear. There's men, there's women. He created both of them created him, created him, like I'm telling you, I really had a hand in this. I really did this. I'm going to repeat it three times. And one of the things that is sad, if you follow, if you read some things of individuals that are struggling and confused by transgenderism, they echo this theme of saying that they are searching for wholeness. And, and that, that word keeps coming up over and over. And now they, they look for their wholeness in something that is apart from their created being. And they do it in ways that are even harmful to their created being, and all in this search to, to be whole. Genesis 127 reminds us of, mm, it's perfect. It's all good. It's all set. The God, one true God, Elohim, created this. He is perfect. He doesn't mess up. So, I love that, yeah, there's a lot to that verse. There's a lot of depth in that verse, but there's also just a whole lot of simplicity in that verse. It's not confusing. So let's read a little bit more. Let's go to Genesis 1. And I'm gonna flip back and forth between slides and the scripture, but because I really do want you to see where this sits on the page of your Bible. I want you to be comfortable with this. I am a Bible marker. And so I will, I will draw, I will underline, I will, you know, I love all the colors and all that. So I encourage you to get comfortable with your Bible. But Genesis 1, 27 and 28, we just read 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then it tells us in 28 that God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So again, Two little verses, but it tells us a lot. And I wanted to just camp out on the, these two verses, especially verse 28 here, to show the things that we are reminded of. But first in 27, we, we saw that number one, we're created in his image. And we just covered that, okay? But the second one, and actually before I, I move on from that, created in his image, the other thing that that is an indication and why that is so significant is because we're created in his image, that is what, why we give life value. Like, this is why Christians, we're, have you ever heard the phrase that Christians, we, we support life, defend life from womb to tomb, right? From the moment you're created in your mother's womb to the day you're in the earth again. That is the extent to which we defend and believe that life is precious and valuable. Where did that come from? Why do we care? It's, I'll tell you what, it's not our own sense of morality right there. It's there because of what it says here in verse one, in 127 because we're created in his image. And that gives every single person unique, amazing worth and value. 
so much more value than we, than we I, I often wanna challenge us on this one. If you could picture in your mind right now, the person who absolutely drives you up a tree. Everybody's got one, it's, I, I know. That person, and or maybe that's even being funny. Maybe there is someone that has really harmed you. There is someone that you just all, that you are so angry towards. That person created in the image of God. The person that has value to their very life because they are created in the image of God. That's how powerful that is. When you go to Genesis 9, 6, that's where we also see in scripture that, that why murder is even wrong. It says in 9, 6, whoever sheds the blood of a man by man shall his blood be shed for God made man in his own image. So there God's telling us right there, it's wrong to commit murder. Why? Because God made man in his own image. So it is significant that we see that. So back to where our, this passage, because I just really want to lock this in for Genesis 1, 27 and 28. We're created in his image was number one. Number two, we've already pointed this out, male and female, the two genders. And we just, I, I'm not, I'm purposely being repetitive because we need to be careful that we don't sterilize this verse. Um, you know, the fact that there are two unique genders, two humans that are going to function differently. And the Bible is going to, throughout Scripture, it's going to keep explaining those differences. And those differences are even going to extend to roles. Now, sometimes people will say, and I, when I say some, there's egalitarians who believe that men and women have equal value and same, like no differences in roles. We, if you've heard the term complementarian, believe we have equal value, but we have distinct roles. And I believe that scripture very much supports this distinction in roles. And we're gonna look at that even more in the, in the coming weeks. But sometimes people will look at this verse, they see 127, this is back to the beginning, I've already told you guys, origin is really important. It's, it's important that we study this. And so they'll look at that and they'll say, well, see, it doesn't show any distinction of roles here in this. So therefore, it, there's no distinction. It's all the same. That would, that, there's a whole lot more pages to go here, folks, okay? And scripture is not going to contradict itself. So it's important for us to keep reading what he says. So we're gonna get to more of those distinctions with roles. But the third thing it tells us in this verse that I just love, it says that we're just blessed. It said that God blessed them. What a sweet, just like little caveat that he puts in this verse here. It's like, yeah, created him, male and feeble. And then it says, and he blessed them. When I see that, it just makes me think just God is just so good. Like he just wants to be good. He loves his kids. He loves his creation. And he just wants to bless them. I love the blessing that is in Numbers, Numbers 6, 24. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. He just wants to. This is, I mean, what a sweet blessing that he gives to us. If you come on Wednesday nights, we sing this at the end of every Wednesday night service. And it, it's just such a reminder, I think, of how good God is to create us, give us distinction, and just bless us. So I love that. We also see that there. The, third, the fourth thing that we see here is that he gives us work to do in this verse. Now we're gonna break these up a little bit. He, he, does, he gives us work to do in being fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, that's one. And then he also gives us the subdue it and have dominion part of that verse. Now we're gonna talk about specifically the subdue it and the dominion part in future weeks when we get to kind of like a theology on work and what that looks like. So that'll be coming as we keep going in the study. But I wanna look at this, you know, just even the be fruitful and multiply part. What, what is that meaning? Because this is, this is the what we're supposed to do. Now, first, that word is tied to our capacity literally to fill the earth. Like anytime it's used in scripture, that is the most clear interpretation and translation that's given. More humans, okay? That's how it's repeatedly used for that clear interpretation. Multiply, okay? It's kind of a big deal in order to sustain life and cultures, but also be fruitful. So this word fruitful, I think is worth looking at a little bit too. So the word fruitful means to flourish, produce an offspring or harvest of the same kind in a successive generation, and also implying abundance. I love that piece at the bottom. A definition comes from uh, the Dictionary of Biblical Languages. And they're, they're 
I, when we share these definitions, we don't do it because I'm not trying to fill your brain with a bunch of stuff and make it sound like we're super smart and we happen to know what this word means. But there is so much more to these uh, words than our English sometimes communicates. And so that's why I, I wanna show these to you. But there are some that would see this and they would go, well, be, the verse there, it says, be fruitful and multiply. And, and they'll say, well, and this is kind of in that camp last week with the academia stuff. They'll say, well, not all women have children. So therefore, specific biological distinctions of being a woman don't exist. That seems like a giant leap to make from there to there, but they do. So you got to be careful on how there, there's a lot to that word, isn't there? You know, women are all created with the capacity to have children. Now that does not mean that the Lord will always ordain every woman to have a child. And there can be even physical constraints in that, but your body is created in such a way that that is the capacity in which you can bear children. This is just a distinction of being female, right? And that's important because the curse is kind of tied back to that one. So you don't want to just chuck that. But you know, what if you're single? Sometimes single women think about this and, and well, where does that leave me? Well, remember what Paul said about this in 1 Corinthians 7, 8, if you're single. He says, to the unmarried and the widows, I see that it is good for them to remain single as I am. Some singles are like, that's really the cheerleading I'm gonna get right there. But that is what Paul is saying here. He really is. And the thing that I think we forget sometimes, Paul, single, Jesus, single. Were these, were these men, were they less men because they weren't married? Or we're just reading the verse of being fruitful and multiply. And so does this mean that a woman of God's design in the physical sense of being fruitful and multiply, that she is incomplete? And that somehow she is not a complete woman because this isn't where the, Lord let, where the Lord ordained her to be married or have children. And this is why I think it's important to see those other ways in which there is fruitfulness in our lives. Whether you have kids or you, not, or you don't have children, there, is, there should be fruit within our lives. There's lots of examples of uh, women in the Bible that sometimes the Bible says they don't have children or maybe we just don't know. But one of the ones that I love is Anna in Luke 2. And she was actually, she was married for a short time, but then she was a, a widow for a really long time. And I think in the temple, she, I think scripture says she's 84 years old and she's been in the temple day and night doing what? She's in the temple telling people that this Messiah is coming. I, I see a woman like that, 84 years old, bearing a whole lot of fruit. Fruitfulness is not always defined by the actual physical having a child. That is a clear way in which scripture, we can't deny that. That's a, that is a perfect example of that as well. But it is not to say that you're incomplete as part of God's design if you're not having that. Do you see how that works? So I also like how Paul is saying, hey, you know what? If you're single, remain single. The other implication is if you're married, stay married, okay? So, but basically remain as you are, unless, and then he gives the unless, you can't stay single and you can go ahead and flip to 1 Corinthians 7, 9, see why. So fruitful harvest of the same kind of successive generation, and then it was implying abundance. I like that definition, but successive generations, meaning a younger generation, so check out Titus 2, because I think this is a good reminder for us as well. Titus 2, 3 through 5 says, older women, and come on, it's not just, you don't have to be 84 for this, okay? Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. That is a lot a fruit right there. And it's, it's, it says to the younger women, meaning to that, that, like it's saying in fruitfulness, the successive generation, but don't forget the implying part of abundance. I, you know, don't look at like, well, okay, I need to achieve some fruit here and do the bare, go big here. You know, it implies that we are to be abundant, be fruitful and multiply. And so many of these two, you see fruits of the spirit in. If you don't know how that fruitfulness can look in your life, Pray, ask the Spirit to show you how you can be fruitful in the season of life that you're in, whether that's single, whether that's married, whether that's widowed, whatever season of life you may be in, the Lord still calls us to be fruitful and multiply. And to that successive generation in these fruits of the Spirit, I love that. So 
we're getting into the coming weeks, some of the things that, I, and I'm repeating myself a little bit because I want to repeat this to kind of rehearse in your minds a little bit. But when we get to talking about that we are, are to have be fruitful and multiply, and also some kind of dominion, the authority questions that we're gonna be coming to in a little bit, in a couple weeks. Biblical womanhood does have authority over things. Again, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. But this is not a blanket statement to rule over everything. That is not what the, the scriptures say here either. So God spoke in various ways in his word on how that authority would look. And here he's quiet in some places on what that should look like. And he's real loud and clear in others. The home, marriage, marriage relationship, his church. He's extremely clear about that. And we're gonna spend all of next Tuesday night talking about those things specifically. But I just wanna keep bringing this up because often people will approach these two verses and say, well, I don't see any of this role stuff that you're talking about here. You know, I referred to that earlier. I don't, I, it just says that men and women there to have dominion over the earth. I don't, I don't see any of this differences here. And I kind of think of it like if anybody actually reads the instruction books to the oven that you might get, I do not. But if you get a brand new oven and you get your brand new instruction manual, you're going to read on page one and it's going to say you can cook anything you want. This is going to be amazing, you know? And it's going to really sell the amazing things that this oven is going to do, that you can cook anything you want. But then page 12 is going to tell you that you kind of need to, you know, set it to this temperature. And it's going to tell you some best uses. And it's going to tell you, don't do this, do this. Nobody would look at that and go, well, that, that's ridiculous. I don't want to, no, it just makes sense. Likewise with the Bible, we're going to see other instructions that are very cohesive here with Genesis that are going to depict distinctions even with roles. The rest of the story is coming. So keep reading God's authoritative word to us because it doesn't change. So how are men and women made? Let's look at that for a second. So Genesis 2 and this is a long section. I'm not going to read this whole thing, but let's go ahead and flip, if you have to flip a page, but go to Genesis 2. And I want to first read verse 7 to you. Because this is going to talk about, we've talked about that he created us, male and female. He's blessed us. He's given us some instructions. And then in verse 7, it kind of gives us um, a, a little backstory, like how were they made? So verse seven says, then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living creature. Okay, so then he's, he'll go on in the story, describes the garden and get introduced, introduced to some trees that might get us into a little trouble here in a minute. And, and then come down to verse 18. And it says, then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of, heaven, of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature that was its name, the man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is at last bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So there's, again, so much, you know, we are so just scratching the surface with this entire study. But to keep it as concise as we can, this section of many things tells us that we're even made men and women of different stuff. Okay, so not only did the verse 127 clearly say that there's, there's two, not male, not female, right? But then he says, you're even made out of different stuff. You're made out of different material. And I think this is interesting. Adam is made from dirt. He's made from dirt. Some of you laughed, okay? Well, we were made from a bone. I, I don't know. So, but made even out of two different substances. And I think this is kind of cool because I think this speaks to the fact that we were always, even from the time, you know, the creator is fashioning the substance in which we're made from, we were always meant to be distinct, different, 
not the same, okay? There is such striving today, it feels like to me, for men to be more feminine and women to be more masculine. And this is kind of a funny thing, and I I have to be careful because I could totally step on toes. There's some things that are a cultural norm. I'll just say it, when I was growing up in Gillette, Wyoming, and, you know, pretty conservative little Baptist church, if a boy came in wearing pink, that was a problem, okay? You would definitely get some stern-looking elders going, son, that's not what we wear here, okay? Because for that culture, and for us, that is, was a symbol of femininity. So my boys still can't wear pink. Anytime they even try to come in with a salmon shirt, I'm like, no, it can't, can't happen, go change. But there, there are things today that, that's just a silly example. No, I don't think if, if your teenage son puts on a salmon colored shirt, it's, you know, no. But there are these movements that we have. Some are really subtle and silly, and some are more overt to either men become more feminine, just soften it a little bit, be more sensitive. Sometimes it's an attitude, sometimes it's the way we dress. And there's a thing for women to do that for the other direction. You gotta be tough. You need to dress tough. There, you know, there's all kinds of different things. And again, it can be a surfacey thing. It could be an outwards thing. It could be an appearance thing. But I don't think it should just be completely disregarded because now, especially as we see all the confusion with transgenderism, when we first start noticing, we can outwardly see that there is something, you can, you can see it, right? Why? Because of how they present themselves. They're presenting themselves as something other than what they were created. So it does matter that we, uh, that we strive to present ourselves in a way that is in agreement with our femininity and that men present themselves in a way that is in agreement with their masculinity. That sounds so old school to say, but it really, it should be kind of clear. Like that, there is just distinctions. We're supposed to look different. We're made out of different things even. But today it's all about, it's gotta be, it's gotta be the same. You know, the world's like screaming for that. You know, you, we, it all needs to be the same. It's all, all got to be equal. And then this has gotten to crazy levels because it's even in our sports now. Well, you, you can't, you got to let girls, you got to let boys be in girls' sports because it's got to be the same. It's got to be the same. The, go read your Bible. Does the Bible say it's got to be the same? It does not need to be the same. And, and, and you just keep seeing like all these examples of distinction, of difference. This is one. This is another not male, not female. I mean, it, the Bible's incredibly clear. Not, it's not being brutal. It's just being really clear. It's funny because, you know, it's, the world wants everything to be the same, but then they scream and scream and scream about diversity. I'm like, well, which one do you want? But, but I do feel like you can honestly, there's so many things about being diverse that scripture's kind of all about in the biblical sense. And that's why I, I love this, you know, us capturing these thoughts of, okay, this is what the world calls diversity. This is what the world calls equality. Okay, what does God's word say are those things? Because if that is so confusing and it's all just a mess, it contradicts itself, it, it's a disaster. This is super clear. And this is why I, there are so many things about the study that excite me so much because to me, this is so freeing for us gals. We don't, we don't have to be bogged down by any, you know, really smart sounding scholar or some philosopher or some guy that just thinks he or girl that thinks they know all the things. Because if they are not agreeing with what the Bible says, I don't need it. This is really simple and clear. So I love that even in what we're made from, we see that there is distinction, there's difference. Okay, so we're kind of, I told you guys, read chapters one, two, and three. It's a great, great story there, right? And it's an important one. We're taking a little, you know, kind of skipping the rock over these passages because everything's going great. And then we get to chapter three, right? We know it's coming and we have to read it. So chapter three, let's start reading in verse one. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened 
and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So again, very common passage. Even if you're, someone doesn't have any familiar, familiarity with the scriptures, they're gonna know how this goes down. But again, we often read past these scriptures so fast that we kind of miss some little, little words here and there. So what did Genesis 3.1 say? Okay, so I, I love this first, you know, the serpent. And this is so, so today, because you can hear this now. Did God actually say, like, really? I, I love this challenge right here, because I hope for you gals, what this does to your mind, if you don't know, if you're like, I actually don't know where that chapter is. I don't know where that verse is. Go look. It, there's nothing that says you need to know when somebody asks you a question, well, well, what does your Bible say about that? That you need to know that answer right on the spot. But it should pique your mind and go, oh, I'm gonna go check. I'm gonna go search the scriptures and find out because it is really important to see what God actually says. It makes a giant difference. So he says, did God actually say? Now, like I've said, we, we got to keep going and looking and seeing what God actually says. So then read to Genesis 2, um, 15 and 17. That's where God actually said it. So we're going to flip back a chapter. You can look in your Bible or you can look up here and it says, the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, here's his instructions. You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Pretty close, pretty close, right? Well, now let's go to Genesis 3.3. What did Eve say that God said? Okay. You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. We got an extra, an extra phrase here that she's thrown in there. So if you put those two things side by side, Genesis 3.3 3 and Genesis 2, what God actually said over here and what Eve said, she did some girl math, guys. She did. She did some girl math and, and she just was like, I got the main thing. I'm just gonna add a little thing right here, okay? I don't know, was she going for dramatics? Was she trying to be very emphatic? And again, this is no judgment on Eve. You gotta remember, like she was the first woman. I kind of think we would have messed up way before that tree even got there, right? But she adds something there. She says, neither shall we touch it. You know, you can say, well, did that really matter? The reason I think it really matters is because as soon as you start adding to things that God said, you're already off course. Have you ever see, heard that example where somebody says, you know, somebody just makes a little tiny compromise and, and they're only like five degrees off. It's not that much. That's not that big a deal. Do we really need to be legalistic and make a huge deal about, you know, five little words, four little words? Really? But as that person continues going in the trajectory that they're going, they keep going, they keep going, they keep going. We're a lot further apart, right? This one just kept the same and the other one keeps going off in its own direction. It's these tiny, tiny, tiny little compromises. These kind, tiny things of like, well, I think that's pretty much what God said. That was pretty much it. My husband doesn't exercise with the boys, whether we're at the kitchen table and kind of talking about something that maybe they heard in class or, and, and, and you know, I always can see where he's going with this because they'll say kind of a verse like, oh, well, you know, it's like what it says in, you know, and they'll list the scripture, highly paraphrased. And every time, I don't know why they, they bother to go here. Every time he's like, go get your Bible. Go get your Bible. Go, let, let's check. Even if they quote that verse almost exactly the way that it's written, he still says, go get your Bible. Let's check. Let's check. Is that what it says? And, and honestly, this is just a great exercise for all of us because I don't know, maybe you guys' memory is amazing. Mine's not. And I can very easily, even if it's unintentionally, do something kind of like Eve, where I, I, I just made a slight word change here. It's important for us to actually get all the words. So go back and see, 
what did God actually say? And in, lest we question that this was as big a deal as it really was, well, then we get a few verses down in chapter three, verse eight, where we see how this kind of goes down and we get the curse. So let's go there. Genesis three, we'll pick up in verse eight. Actually, I'm gonna, let's go a little bit further down. He, that, there's a long description there of, and again, because you all read Genesis one through three, so you already know all this stuff, but God kind of, he finds out. Did God find out? No, no, God already knew. But God has this, he, he wonders where they are. Because now, it, it, did you catch that part of what we just read where it says they, they found themselves naked? That's the first time you see shame being introduced in scripture. It's the first kind of is symptom, I suppose, that you could see of their sin, of their disobedience, is that they have this knowledge, they have this understanding of shame. Why don't you go down to verse 15? And this is where the curse kind of picks up steam here. He talks to the serpent and he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. This is an important passage here. I'm not gonna spend time on, but when we do our, when you get your study book in the fall, you're gonna spend some time because this is a very important passage that's actually describing the gospel in a really cool way. But keep going to verse 16, because this is where we get to the curse to the woman. And he says, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire, to, your, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Let's go ahead and read the man's curse as well. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you and the pain you shall eat of it all your days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth and you shall eat the plants of the field. So, well, let me finish the thought. By the sweat of your face and you shall eat bread till you return to the ground for out of it you are taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return. So there's the curse, the serpent, the man, or the, uh, the woman and the man. So let's look at the curse to the woman here. Genesis 3.16 is where we see that. And to the woman, he says, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Now that's significant in that, do you notice that it's tied back to something that we were created to do? Like our primary uh, purpose in how our created beings are, being female, having the capacity to bear children, the curse is tied to that. And that's interesting to me because as we finished up that piece to the, to the man, his curse was tied to what he was first employed to do, and that was to work and keep it. We might read that in just a second if we have time. But two parts here to this curse. It says pain and childbearing. And then it says your, your, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. So let's break this verse up just a little bit, okay? Because there's a lot in just, just the little half of this. So first you see that word desire. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband. What are we talking about there? Again, lots of, lots of words to say one, one English word here. It can be everything there from emotion or feeling to having something. Also, that it's a strong desire. It can be for sexual urges or desires, but also to dominate or just be independent of man. That's why you got to put it all in there, okay? There is a lot there. Now, I don't, uh, you know, I, I am no, no Hebrew scholar here. So that's why I appreciate when lexicons will kind of dig into what, they're, what these words are talking about here. So the desire here to be in charge, the desire to dominate, that's what this word is, is wrapped up here in the curse here. So a couple other words I, I want to point out to you here. You have the rule over you govern, be in charge, have a person or entity to exercise authority over. Now, if you, if you will, because the language is so, so similar, I want you to see Genesis 4, 7 real quick. Just flip in your Bible or you can let me read it to you. But 4, 7 uh, says, this is a Cain and Abel, and um, the story that goes on after they're being, they leave the garden. But it says in verse 7, at the very end, it says, and if you do not do well, it says sin is crouching at your door. It's desire, it's meaning sin, is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Now I point that out because that is pretty similar wording to what we see right here. 
that your desire will be contrary to your husband, but you shall rule, but he shall rule over you. So it, there, there are things that you need to see with that because sometimes people will look at this whole issue of us having control over something, over, over men and, and having that desire to do so as this is then why submission, you know, that's just really part of the curse to be overturned. That, that's, that's an idea that people will talk about that. And, but the, the thing is, is that I think that's again where we kind of get into that trap where we start judging something based on its abuses of something and not necessarily upon its created order and perfect design of something. Because this, this idea here that your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. There is this idea that's put into the background of this verse, maybe not really that in the background, that Adam, that man was gonna have some authority in this, with woman. And there's lots of examples we could talk about with this. You could even look at um, that man was created first, right? So we just, even by sheer order, he's first, she was created second. There's language in that she was created to be a helper. Don't get freaked out by this is like mommy's little helper role. There's a whole lot more to that word than is there. It's still something that is secondary, is, is assisting the purpose of the first. That's not offensive. That's actually a created order thing. So there is, there is language here that is talking about the authority that would be there. Now the curse is saying, but you're gonna want that authority. You want that. The other examples I wanna show you just a little bit, because maybe that's, you're like, well, I, don't really, I don't really know if I really buy that just because he was created first, he should be, have the authority there. But there's, there's other things in that. In Genesis 2, 23, I already read that to you a minute ago, but that was the part where it says, this is the last bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man, taken from him. And that's significant. Again, created first, but not even the same substance, but from man, from something else. The New, New Testament talks about that too. Um, we're not gonna go there, but the New Testament also references that same thing. So there is this authority of one created being man over another, but there's more to it even than that. So look at Genesis 3.20. In Genesis 3.20, it says, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. You're like, okay, great. No, he named her. Can just anyone name you? You know, if, if you have kiddos, you don't go to the nurse in the hallway and go, well, what do you want to name him? I don't know. They don't have authority to do that. There is authority. And again, it's hard to, because we have concepts of that word even that need to be redeemed by scripture. We need to have a biblical understanding of what we're talking about with that. Because sometimes we have such worldly ideas that have been either portrayed badly by someone and we had someone in an abuse of authority that we just hear that word and we're like, ooh, that's gotta be bad. It's not bad. And, and that's why we just need to keep reading it through the filter of scripture to understand what God's talking about with that. But there, I think you can't deny that there is, this, there is this authority that we see that Adam has here. He names her. He, he gets to do that. And so this is gonna be, this theme is gonna be carried out throughout scriptures as husbands are called to be head of their homes. Men are called to be head of the church. You know, there, this, this is going to be continued as a, as a theme through scripture because it started all the way back here as God's perfect created design that he said, this is how this was going to look. So the curse, it, it felt a little brutal, pain in childbirth. I think maybe that could even continue into further parenting. Is there emotional pain? Is there a constant worry with your children? I have kids in college and I still go, well, did you eat today? <sighs> Sometimes no. So, we, so it can go on, but there, there's this idea of that there is pain in childbirth. But we also see, I, I alluded to this a minute ago, that there is this, this, the curse to man and woman are tied to something that was within their primary function. We see that, that women, that it says you have pain in childbirth. But I just wanted to show you the verse real quick in, in Genesis 2.15. Because this is where, let me find it here, 2.15. It says, God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Now look where that, that happens. That's before, that's before the curse. That man was to work and keep the garden. Wasn't, it wasn't the curse itself. The curse was 
his primary function, what he was tasked to do, and that was that the ground would be cursed. Like your work, like the results, like it, it's, that you're gonna struggle. There's gonna be thorns and thistles and all kinds of things. It's gonna feel like it's just pouring through your hands. But the work itself wasn't a curse to man or woman. But remember, we were also had dominion over the land uh, or the fish of the sea and all those kinds of things too. So we'll get to that in more detail. So the first thing there is that we'd have pain and childbirth was in the curse. But that second one is that we would just have this desire to call the shots. Now, some people look at this and they go, okay, well, is this just to married women? Because it says husband there. Now, I already flipped past the slide. But if you notice there, when we were there, when it said husband, and again, not a Hebrew scholar, guys. So I'm, I'm, re, I'm referring to people that actually know these things. That word is used for man, for male. It's used for, it's, it's a more of a general term. Sometimes it does specifically mean husband. So I'm gonna leave that to the Hebrew scholars to figure out. But the thing that I don't think you can look at that and go, well, it says husband here. So this, must, this cursed thing just doesn't apply to me as a single. Does anybody feel like the curse doesn't affect them? I, I don't get this. This is actually like a legit line of thinking for, for some um, scholars is that, that this just doesn't apply. And I think there's more to that. Look at Romans 5.12, because this is where it's talked about, about the curse for all, all time. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, so it's talking about Adam, death and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. So I don't think that anybody's left out of this. Now, if you read that curse and you're like, okay, but it said, so you're saying I, I, there's this authority over all men. Remember, keep reading the word because as we get to where it's talking about, if you're married, you're to submit to your own husband, okay? That's not, that's not a blanket submission to every man that's walking around. Absolutely not. So keep reading the context in which this is being presented. But why I bring this up is because sin, it was the disobedience ultimately that brought death to all of us. So I, I don't think any of us gets a pass here. And the tension's just there. The, and I, maybe you wanna call it tension, you wanna call it just sin, that with, especially with the contrary to rule over them, because gals, come on, sometimes we just think we know better, okay? I should be able to tell you what to do. And, and, and this does not matter if it is, you know, directions to the store or the best way to load the dishwasher. We know stuff. And really, you should kind of just do it my way. And I, I really just think it, there is just this desire and you're like, okay, Amy, speak for yourself. You're just really bossy. That was written on my kindergarten report card for sure. <laughs> but to contradict that we don't have this thing that says whether it's, you know, a career change or a career choice that your husband may want to make, or even if it's just the way it, another, maybe in a workplace, something that, a, a man decides to do, we still think we know better, you know? You could also say that sometimes we get that way even with other women too, right? My point is just to say, is that to say that we are not in this mold of being contrary and wanting to rule over somebody, wanting to be dominant over, and specifically that curse was relating to being independent of man. And man, our culture has just done, a, they've done a beautiful marketing job on this one, haven't they? You know, they have just made this look like, you know, it is just so easy. You know, you gals can, you can do it all yourself. You don't need any man. That is, that is not only such a sad burden, it, it is, it's, it's a heavy burden. It's sad because it's, it's clearly not what scripture put in there, but it is 100% a burden that we were not meant to carry. To think that we just, we need to be independent, that's tied in there with that curse. And I think to contradict that is either being silly or dishonest, because it's really, that's just something we want to do. We're the boss. We like it that way. I want to show you this Elizabeth Elliot quote that always makes me pause. And she says, in her book, Let Me Be Woman, and I will say, if you have not read this book, if there was a, a, a book to go along with a study on biblical womanhood outside of what we're doing here, absolutely read this if you have not. But she says, what sort of world might it have been if Eve had refused the serpent's offer and had said to him instead, let me not be like God. Let me be what I was made to be. Let me be a woman. I kind of thought about that phrase this week. Because what, what does that look like? 
That's kind of why we're here, right? What does it look like for me just to be what God created me, created me to be? Nothing more, nothing less, just a woman. Now, I'm not meaning that in like a condescending, like overly simplistic thing. I'm meaning it as what we just read about tonight. Just, just be who God made you to be. What would that look like? And, and I don't think that answer, that question is answered by, you know, a witty quote or something that will just wrap it up real quickly in a nice little bow for us. But I think we find it through careful study of the scripture. Genesis is our origin story. It's where we came from. And so it's a good start. And I think it, it is important, and maybe this, what I get, this little challenge from this quote a little bit, is sort of a little line in the sand moment with the enemy to say, I will be who God made me to be. That's all. And can you kind of plug your ears and wipe out the distractions of the rest of the nonsense of like, oh, but you could do this and you know better than this person over here. You know better than your husband. You know, but that is the enemy lying to you. And in doing the same thing that he did to Eve in the garden. You know, I, I've talked about this before. It'll, it'll come up again and we need to keep this in mind. What were the things that trapped Eve up? It was wanting to know more. Man, that can get us into trouble, ladies. Know more of the scripture. But the idea of just this understanding and enlightenment to be like God well, that's what Satan's aim is because he wants to detract and take away from anything that would, would make us focus on something else other than God. He does not want him to be worshiped. So I love that we can kind of think of this and, and I hope that's as freeing to you guys as it is to me to think that we can actually just say, nope, nope. I am just going to be what God says that I am. And, and what is that? We looked at that and I repeated it over and over. Created in his image, which gives us incredible, unspeakable worth. He commands us with stuff to do. He gives, tells us to be fruitful and multiply. He tells us that fruitful, multiply. Think of the Great Commission. Go and make disciples. Matthew 28, 19 tells us that. But recognize that the effects of our sin, which resulted in the curse, that is the wages of sin. And it's death, Romans 6, 23 says. But don't forget there's more to that verse. But the gift of God is eternal life. We're not left in our sin and our desire to be contrary. We can go look to Christ and we can find how we can be complete through him. And, and that gives us victory over sin in our flesh. It's, it, but it's a freeing thing that he not only, yeah, he sees the mess that we got ourselves in, but he gave us an answer for it. He didn't leave us with, I guess you'll figure it out. Keep reading the book. It keeps telling us over and over and over how much he loves us. I love as we read this, just that we can see the perfection and the completeness with which God made us. On the, on, we've talked about before um, how we can see the goodness of God. You know, that, that very first part when we were talking about how his image reflects how we can understand his attributes. And one of those is that he is good. And when you read Genesis, the first chapter, it keeps saying he created this and it was good and it was good. It, it's good because he is good. And, you know, not to throw, I guess, all of us under the bus a little bit, but I will, because we sit here and we question that that there must have been, well, we must need to understand this curse a little bit differently, or we need to understand such and such, because that surely isn't what God meant. He is good. He is perfect. He doesn't make mistakes. One final scripture in Psalm 139, 13 through 14, it just puts it so perfectly. You, for you formed me in my inward parts, and you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. When we think about just let us be woman, what that should look like, it's a complete picture. It's not missing something. We have the entire word of God, all the scripture to, to point us to what that looks like. But here tonight, we've looked at where it all started. 
And it was a good, it was a perfect creation where no mistake was made. He did not leave anything out. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's something that is freeing. That's something that we can rejoice in. That's something that we can thank the Lord, praise the Lord for how he created us because it was good. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are so good. We thank you for how you've created us. And we, we ask that you would forgive us for the times that we think there's something lacking in your design. Because Lord, nothing is lacking in you and nothing is lacking in, the, in what you have made. It is good. Lord, I pray for the gals in this room, the gals watching online, that we would just keep coming back to your word to see what you actually say about us what you actually say about you and who you are, that we may better understand the God who made us, who loves us, who died for us, that we would understand that you don't want us to have this heavy burden that the world wants to throw on us. You just want us to be who you made us to be, and that's it. And Lord, I want to be just thankful for that. I want to praise you for that. And I pray, Lord, that you would find a group of women that even when we wrestle with things, I, I, I pray that you would provide your scripture to remind us and prompt us to the truth of your word, that you, you knew what you were doing, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made and how marvelous are your works. Lord, we're just so thankful. So Lord, I pray that as these scriptures that we've read, I pray that these would just take deep root in our hearts, in our minds. I pray that they would just be on the front of our minds, even as we, as we see things, as we leave here tonight, we see things out in the world, Lord. I pray that we would constantly be coming back to what you actually say, Lord. And I pray that you would just instruct us and we would have soft hearts for what you would say. In Jesus' name, amen.